there are conspiracies. So a conspiracy mm. theory is just an idea that there might be a conspiracy. Welcome to How the Light Gets In. Um, so the, the subject of your book, Conspiracy, is something I'm really interested in because I used to have quite a close friend when he was 14. And in his sort of mid-teens, he went through what I would describe to be a very conspiratorial phase. So he started believing in everything from Michelle Obama as a man, 9-11 is an inside job, the Bilderberg group are ruling the, ruling the world, um, pedophiles in Westminster, yeah. pedophiles in all areas of Canada. And what I saw it to be was this kind of, there was this emotional turning point that maybe happened in his mid-teens where everything he had, he was a reasonably smart guy, but everything he had was reinterpreted through this kind of emotional lens into a semi-convincing, but obviously at the end absurd sounding narrative that these sorts of th theories are true. So my first question is, what goes through the conspiracy theorist's mind and why do people start believing in conspiracy theorists? And what do you think maybe about this case? That I've talked about? Yeah, that's an interesting case because you described him as being in this kind of state of uncertainty, mm. transition, uh, anxiety. That is one of the driving forces of conspiracism. We know from tons of research on this that uh, when people are induced to be in a state of anxiety or uncertainty or out of control, um, either artificially in a lab or through natural disasters or whatever, they become far more conspiratorial. You know, it wasn't just that the storm happened, you know, somebody made the storm, made the building collapse or, you know, something bad happens. We know there are forces, natural forces behind it, but but why at that time and why that building, you know, that this happened to me and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So uh, anxiety, uncertainty, uh, conspiracism is a way of gaining control and putting order on a chaotic system. For the most part, the world is, is very random and chaotic. Nobody is in control. And for a lot of people, that's worse than the Bilderberger group or the, you know, the, the, the Illuminati running the show, nobody's running the show. And it's like, what? <laughs> you know, you mean inflation just happens and, and just, you know, these kind of political economic forces are at work and, and no one's behind it? No. And I think for a lot of people, they'd rather have some structure. Because one of the interesting things you say is that conspiracy theorists and that kind of mindset cuts across race, it cuts, cuts across gender, it cuts across class and uh, numerous other factors. One of the other factors though that I want to ask you about, do you think conspiracy theories cut across intelligence as well? I mean, do you think you can have in very, very smart people who are conspiracy theorists and yeah. why, why is that the case? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I addressed this problem in my first book, Why People Believe Weird Things with the final section, why smart people believe weird things. And the answer is because they're better at rationalizing beliefs that they arrived at for non-smart reasons, mm. okay? So if anything, the more intelligent and educated you are, the better you are at constructing reasons for why you believe things. That is, is not the reason you came to that belief in the first place. Most conspiracy theories are proxies for something else. You know, do you really think Hillary's running a pedophile ring out of a pizzeria in Washington, D.C.? You know, I think most people go, well, no, probably not. But but it's the kind of thing those Democrats would do. Mm. You know, and I don't like the, you know, so it's a stand in for something you don't like or you don't trust. You know, I don't trust big corporations. I don't trust big government agencies. So they're up to something. So if you show me, well, OK, that one's not true. They didn't actually assassinate JFK or make 9-11 happen. But they do other things that are bad. Right. And uh, and so, but but there's a kind of constructive conspiracism to some of that, in as much that corporations do sometimes cheat the regulatory state, uh, and sometimes you know Wall Street traders do inside trading, and corporations do bad things, and governments do bad things, uh, and sometimes the CIA has been involved in assassinating leaders, not our leaders, but other foreign countries, right? So enough bad things happen that people think. You know, maybe this one's not true, but, you know, these people, they really do bad things. So I should be suspicious. It's kind of a constructive paranoia. Because part of the problem with conspiracy theorists is this problem about the intelligence thing that you said, which is smart people are better at rationalizing uh, things for stupid reasons. 
So sometimes you get, so with my friend, for example, I couldn't actually a lot of the time meet him on his own terrain because he'd have all these facts about yes, how 9-11 yes. might be an inside right. job or he'd have all these facts about um, I know various other things, paedophile groups and evidence that had come out. It takes ages to go through and Track study and analyze yeah. properly. So when you approach that, clearly you can't just look at conspiracy theorists scientifically sometimes. You want to live a normal life and you want to be able to pass between but what's what's crazy and what's not crazy so i mean how do you approach that sort of issue where some things are just some things are just clearly crazy but the person making that argument is making it in such a convincing and um scientific sounding way what's the way of sort of analyzing yeah. that or approaching well part of the problem is is this is what we call anomaly hunting like mm -hmm. your friend will have 27 little anomalies about 9-11. How do you explain, you know, the mm. melted steel there? And exactly. how do you explain yeah. the passport ended up over there? And so on. And, and if you can only answer 20 of them, he's like, I got, got you. See, these others you didn't. Okay. Yeah. So, and nobody can know everything. Uh, I know a lot about these things, and I still run into stuff I've never heard. Like, what? Okay, that's a new one. Uh, and, and, and so part of the process there is that the bigger the event and in importance, the more anomaly hunting people go. Mm -hmm. uh, like if JFK, if it wasn't JFK and Dealey Plaza, what if it was the mayor of mm -hmm. Dallas that was assassinated? Would anybody care about any mm -hmm. of this stuff? No, there'd be no books or movies about it. Or if Oswald had shot at Kennedy and missed, mm -hmm. would we be talking about? No, you know, so it all depends on how big and important the event is. So we have this thing called a proportionality bias. The bigger the event, the bigger the cause has to be to match it. And so you have like, you know, the Holocaust and the Nazi regime, you know, the worst thing in it that ever happened to some, a, a group of people by the worst political regime in history, there's a match there. But if you take, you know, JFK and Lee Harvey Oswald, it's like this leader of the free world is taken down by some lone nut or, you know, 9-11, you know, 19 guys with box cutters, come on. Mm -hmm. You're telling me they pulled it, there's no way, it has to be a big, mm -hmm. big conspiracy. Princess Diana, cause of death, mm -hmm. drunk driving, speeding, no seatbelt. Princesses are not supposed to die like every, you know, there had to be something, you know, because it's huge. It has mm. to be something big behind it. So that distorts people's thinking about that. And what, so part of the problem that you said as well is that some conspiracy theorists have, theories have actually turned out to be true in the past, which gives people the suspicion that they could be true in the future. And then you have someone smart enough to actually point that out and say, well, look, these things, they might seem unlikely, but they've happened before. Could you just discuss a little bit the kinds of conspiracy theories that were theories that were true and how that could distort the argument sometimes? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I mentioned the CIA, so they had mm. the uh, MK Ultra program, which was a mind control uh, program. Mm -hmm. And this included uh, using psycho, uh, psychotropic drugs uh, on unsuspecting citizens that American citizens are protected by the Constitution, yeah. right? Uh, and uh, 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 or you know the uh, plotting of of um, uh, uh, of rigging elections in third world countries to favor the fascist dictator over the communist dictator because it's better for mm -hmm. American business interests in this foreign country, including attempting to assassinate foreign leaders like Castro. Um, the FBI's um, COINTELPRO, which was the counterintelligence program to spy on and infiltrate and try to bring the demise to American civil rights groups, uh, civil rights, women's rights, Native American rights. You know, there, there'd be multiple agents in these meetings to try to disrupt them or to record them or, to, you know, just try to harm them. Our government was doing this to our own people, mm, mm. right? When I say R, I mean American. <laughs> uh, you know, there's enough of that. You know, they, they tape recorded Martin Luther King hmm. Jr. in hotel rooms with women to blackmail him. Hmm. You know, this is revenge porn. This is blackmail. This is illegal. Hmm. And our own intelligence agency was practicing this. It's aston hmm. astonishing. Uh, and so you hear enough of these stories, you know, Watergate and uh, uh, Ran Contra and so on. There's hundreds of, you know, these kind of, our government was doing what? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, WikiLeaks has you know revealed a lot about the Iraq War and Afghanistan. Uh, you know what what was going on there. It's like whoa, you know, Congress didn't approve any of this. Um, 
So people hear enough of that. It's not irrational to be very suspicious of mm -hmm. big corporations, big government agencies. They do things like that. Mm. And because part of what we're talking about at the moment is people's propensity to believe in certain theories. But from my friend and from other things that I saw, a lot of it seemed not only to be believing in conspiracies, but sort of believing almost in the charisma of a certain person who's putting forward conspiracy theories. This BBC Three documentary, Andrew Tate's got his house, and there are people who sort of come outside their house and take pictures. And there's this BBC Three guy called Matt Shea, and he was taking a picture with um, this guy outside. And the guy was saying, this Andrew Tate fan, there's no way that Andrew Tate could have possibly done this. And, and then Matt Shea asked, so what's the threshold of evidence that you'd need for Andrew Tate to have done it? The only threshold I would accept, he said, was if Andrew Tate said it himself. And Matt Shea's response to that was saying, that's quite, was to say, that's quite a lot of power for someone to have over your mind. Yes. So the question I'm asking, I guess, is do you think a lot of conspiracy theorists, uh, theories are also to do with the fact that there are extremely charismatic and powerful figures that are then able to push their a message through uh, Certainly that's media. part of it, but it doesn't have to be that. I mean, mm -hmm. the 9-11 truth movement, there wasn't any one particular charismatic person, but it was kind of more of a bottom-up right. roots through that first viral video ever produced, Loose Change. I mean, seen by tens of millions of people. Yeah. Uh, astonishing they could get those kind of views. Um, you know, they're the problem is that conspiracy theories are not falsifiable. Yeah. Like, what would it take for you to change your mind? And the answer is often nothing will change mm. my mind. I just know this is true. Mm. It's, at that point, really, the conversation's over. It's like, well, okay. Uh, but, you know, I always just ask, you know, what would it take? Or what, would, what kind of counter evidence? You know, what's, where's your threshold? Now, sometimes you can find it. Like the 9-11 truthers, there's one extreme branch of them called the no planers. They don't think there were any airplanes. <laughs> they think it was all CGI and uh, and it's like, and even the 9-11 mm. truthers, the regular ones go, oh, yeah, those yeah, guys yeah. are crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't believe that. This, this is really interesting because my friend had a similar thing to this, which is there were gradations of conspiracies that he'd accept. So the, the first, the most that he'd accept would be some of Alex Jones's stuff that maybe, um, you know, uh, the U.S. government are like trying to turn frogs gay or something yeah, like that. Right. I, can't, I can't remember what that one was. Yeah, I think that. But was he wouldn't one. go to. I'm not sure if you've heard of a conspiracy theorist called David Icke. Yeah, I know. You've probably, David you've probably Icke. Oh, yes. heard of him. He wouldn't go as far as to say lizards are ruling the world. Like yeah. even that was too crazy. Yes, to him. Yes, so right. maybe comment a little bit on that. Like there seems to be subgroups within conspiracy yes, theorists yes. and yes. some conspiracy theorists who who go further than other conspiracies. Yeah, so what's so going on there? This is called the line of demarcation. Where do mm -hmm. you demarcate the line between science and pseudoscience or between fact and fiction or fantasy? Mm -hmm. And everybody has their line. Yeah. You know, and you know, so, so the, but the, but none of us want to be too gullible and believe everything our government says and get suckered in, right? So it's good to have a line somewhere yeah. and say, you know, this is my criteria. This is the level of my criteria to say that's that's mm. actually true. And uh, in science, we actually have methods of, you know, delineating this statistically. Here's the experiment you run. Here's the analysis you should do. And if it reaches this level, then we'll say hit. It's probably a, a real effect. It's probably not due to chance. If you're below that level, it's due to chance. It's not publishable. You know, so th those kinds of things are worked out. For most conspiracy theorists, you know, the, the filter is wide open. Hmm. You know, uh, they, 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 it doesn't take much for them to say, I think there's something to this one. You know, there's some interesting research on this that also people, like the my favorite paper is called Dead and Alive. Hmm. People that would uh, tell posters they think Princess Diana was murdered hmm. were also more likely to say she faked her death. And she's still alive somewhere. It's like, you can't be both dead and alive. Okay, these are rather contradictory yeah. ideas. But, but so the, the, the idea is that behind that is, I don't trust authorities. So mm -hmm. when the government says she died in a car accident, I don't believe it. Mm. You know, you know it's, it, it, maybe she's faked her death. Oh, or they murdered her. I don't know what it is, but I don't trust. You know, it's a, so it's kind of this kind of global paranoia uh, about anybody with power. Hmm. So the moment somebody gets rich, conspiracy theories gravitate to them. You know, Elon Musk is the latest one, uh, or Jeff Bezos, or you know, whoever it was, Bill Gates before, 
and, you know, and then he kind of fell off the radar until uh, COVID, and then he got behind the vaccine. He's like, aha, he's back, <laughs> you know, trying to do things. So anybody with power, money, if there's not a lot of transparency where people can't see what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, what are they up to behind those closed doors? That drives conspiracism. And another thing I wanted to ask you about is obviously belief in conspiracy theories taken too far is a social problem for some people in the sense with why Fred pushed them so far. I mean, he had this kind of mindset, but he pushed himself so far that he started alienating himself from other people. Yeah. And then yeah. also, if you are a diehard Andrew Tate supporter and you believe the whole Matrix conspiracy theory or that women are somehow ganging up against men to to uh, to push them out in the gene pool or something in, in a in a kind of explicit way um how do you approach someone who has the conspiracy mindset to try and get them out out of it because sometimes they are beyond rational argument some people are you may never reach them mm -hmm. um if it's your friend or family member mm -hmm. you know you can uh, you, you can probe gently asking lots of questions mm. you know don't do a full frontal attack you know this is all you know bullshit and you shouldn't believe it that's just they're just going to put up the wall the more their identity is wrapped up in the belief mm. the less likely they are to abandon it so you have to kind of do an end run around first of all you got to figure out what it is that is behind the belief and then try to do an end run around that and just try to figure out why is it you believe that particular thing right there you know, like, again, what would it take to change your mind? Hmm. And, uh, you know, what's the source of your evidence? How reliable is that source? Do you trust that source? And why don't you trust these other sources? And so on. And, and, and most you can do really is just try to plant a seed of doubt and hope it takes. Can you expand on what you said there? When the more that your identity is wrapped up, um, w w in a conspiracy, the harder yeah, it is. To, so, so what yeah. precisely do you mean by that? Yeah, so say take something like global warming. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, anthropogenic uh, uh, global warming was bundled with the liberal democratic side of things with Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth. Yeah. So conservatives after that said, oh, well, that's one of those liberal, those libtards are up to... You know something bad here with this climate they want to control business mm. they want to you know end fossil fuels they want to destroy the american economy whatever they're anti-capitalists and so when a conserv conservative hears climate change their brain just auto corrects to anti-capitalism and i'm a pro free market guy so i'm against this mm. thing. most people don't know anything about it i mean I'll, I'll tell you some interesting research by cognitive psychologists on this um like if you ask students, you know, do you accept the theory of evolution and yes. not creation? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Explain it. Well, they actually can't explain how the, yeah. the theory is, right? They don't really know. Uh, and, but So what they're doing is they're signaling, I trust the science for the most part. Those guys yeah, usually exactly. get it right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or NAFTA. Do you support NAFTA? Are you against NAFTA? You know, North American Free Trade Agreement. People will vocally say they support it or they're against it. But if you ask them, well, what is it? They don't really know. Hmm. So again, most of these things, none of us know. I, I don't know climate science very well. I, it's not my field. I trust that the scientists who are competitive with each other and try to debunk each other, and by the time it filters out to me as a consensus, here's what the scientists say, I think it's probably right. So I'll, I'll maybe pose a challenge to that, which is, this is directly from my old friend, which is he used expertise as a mechanism to justify his conspiracy theories. Right. And what happens if you get into that terrain? It's, it's not it an just, argument from authority, mm. uh, because it's not one person you're saying, well, this yeah. guy told me climate change is real, so I'll accept. No, it's a community of experts in a mm. field that, that this is what they do. They argue against each other. They try to debunk each other. Yeah. And by the time they get to a consensus, there's a reasonably good chance it's probably true. Mm. You know, and, and when the consensus breaks down and people are like all over the place, like here at the string theory thing, yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like, all right, but then maybe this is, a, I don't know what, to, I don't know anything about string theory, but yeah. if they can't agree and these are the world's experts, well, there's probably something, there's not probably a problem here. Because mm. it's interesting what you said about a lot of people not being able to, um, lay out the theory of evolution. I could probably do it in a little bit of detail, but I can't do it in nearly enough detail to be able to debate someone like Stephen Meyer, I think his yes, name Stephen is. Meyer, the, yes, yes. Steve, Stephen Meyer, who seems incredibly articulate in yes, the way that he presents yeah, his theory. Yeah. seems very 
unlikely that a science that his use of science somehow leads to a very specific type of god that he just so happen that it's just so right. happens to have matched right. his belief in maybe growing up from a young age. I've got a slight suspicion that, yes. that maybe that's not quite it's the case. But maybe you can talk about that. It's a reasonable suspicion. On the one hand, there is this uh, logical fallacy, the uh, the genetic fallacy, mm. that the origin of the idea doesn't tell us whether it's right or wrong. Sure, exactly. Okay, fair enough. Mm. I mean, you could say, well, Shermer, you're an atheist because of your upbringing, whatever. Uh, it's it should be irrelevant, you know. But to your point, <laughs> if it so happens that all of the science just happens to agree with my politics, my religion, come on, you know, yeah. you know, what are the chances of that? And by the way. Mm. What if the science changed? Would you yeah. give up your religion? Mm. You know, if it turned out that you know, whatever Stephen Meyer argues about the structure of the cell or the bacteria flagellum or the fine tuning, you know, what if the cosmologist came up with an explanation for the fine tuning? It's obvious because of this particular, here's the equation. You know, would you say, you know, I guess I'm not a Christian anymore? No, of course not, because it was never based on that in the first place. Mm. Right? So it's a kind of a backing into the belief after the fact now that I know what's true, let me see if I can back it up with arguments and evidence. Mm. It's interesting because I think George Orwell was the one one who said that if he were if he were approached by a flat earth, he'd lose the argument. It's a similar <laughs> yeah. similar thing. Seems like a similar thing. You have to, what to you're prepare saying, yeah. if you're going to debate these people. You got to prepare. Yeah. And know, you have to know what their arguments are, not yeah. what the science is. You know, I remember back in the '80s watching some biologists debate creationists, mm -hmm. and they didn't do well. Because they yeah. thought, well, I understand this theory. I'm just going to lay it out and everybody will see I'm right. No. Yeah. They have a whole other agenda. Could you comment a little bit? Because we've talked a little bit about religion as well. What, and I'm guess, guessing you might comment on it a little bit in the book. What are the parallels that you might see between some forms of religious belief and conspiracy? Because a lot of people like to say that there are some. Uh, well, of course, there's different specific religious conspiracy theories about yeah. what happened in the past or whatever. But in terms of like, are religious people more or less likely to believe conspiracy theories? It, uh, no, it, it, it's same thing with politics or race or gender. It, it, but it directs you uh, which ones are going to appeal to you, and um, yeah. So I mean, now politically, um, you know, the the conservatives that are religious tend to suspect they never liked Democrats in the first place just because they're on the other team. But now it's gotten worse that, you know, they're they're up to no good. They want to destroy America. Hmm. You know, they hate America. They hate democracy, whatever it is. And actually, and now the left is doing that a lot with the right now. So this is, you know, polarizing things. That's a kind of conspiracy theory. Not just that, you know, you believe in uh, a lower tax and I want a higher tax. And, well, we just disagree on these things, but we can go have a beer. No, it's that, you know, you, you, your beliefs, you just, you, you just want to destroy our country. Mm. And I'm not going to have a beer with you. I mean, that, I don't even want to talk to you because mm. you're evil, right? So that's, that, that's a kind of conspiracy theory. So do you think part of combating it is just becoming a wiser person? Wiser, well, or is, yeah. it, is, is that laden with problems as well? Because Maybe. how do we define what, yeah. what, what wisdom is? Yeah, it, it, it just has to do with what, you're, what, what should you believe and why? Mm. And just, I just always asking people, why is it you believe that? Just, just tell me. I mean, like just on related topics, you know, cults. You know, no one in the history of the world has ever joined a cult. They, they join a group that they think is going to yeah. be really good. Yeah, exactly. And you know, later it turns out it wasn't such a good idea. Or, you know, no one's ever ever identified as a pseudoscientist. Mm. I'm always accusing people of being pseudoscience, but no, they don't think that's what they're doing. Mm. And you know, conspiracy theorists, they they don't think it's a crazy conspiracy theory which is what the term has come to me. They think it's true. Yeah. Which is why in my book, I try to reframe the whole thing. Like there are conspiracies. So a conspiracy mm. theory is just an idea that there might be a conspiracy. Yeah. And maybe there is. So let's just mm. lay it out and let's see what the evidence is. Unfortunately, in, in popular parlance, conspiracy mm. theory means crazy. Yeah. Oh, that's mm. just one of those conspiracy theories, maybe, meaning it's just a crazy Alex Jones kind of yeah. thing. Because I do, because on the other end of the spectrum, obviously, it's we do need to try and try and get rid out of not not by not by force or anything, but out of common discourse, crazy conspiracies like Michelle Obama's a man, or all those <laughs> yeah. all, the, all those sorts of things. But sometimes that very language of conspiracies, as you're saying, 
can be used to dismiss political views that actually might have might hold quite a lot of yes. legitimacy to yes. them. So there, there has to be some kind of balancing point yes. between them. Yes, I mean, before the six, 1960s, you know, it was kind of common to think, uh, consp think cons propose conspiracy theories about things you thought were happening. Yeah. It was mostly, you know, the Catholics are doing this and the Jews mm. are doing that, you know, and it, they were mostly political and religious conspiracy theories, but it was pretty common in the in the language. Mm. After the 60s, you know, conspiracy theory became kind of associated with fringe. Oh, you're one of those JFK assassination conspiracy theorists that are, you know, the nut nutters, and it became a pejorative. Yeah, and final question about conspiracies. If there's one conspiracy that you could point to, either currently or in the past, that has been of the most systematically damaging one that you can think of. Well, what at the moment, the, you know, the rigged election 2020. Yeah. Okay. Only because it's still around and because mm. Trump is still around. You know, had he conceded, this would have never taken off. You know, normally what happens is like after Attorney General Bill Barr said, you know, that resources the Department of Justice, we looked into it, there's nothing there. Most yeah. most of the time they go, all right, let's just cut straight on the next election, but mm. not not Trump. So he's changed the game there. Mm. <laughs> He, you know, he's invented a conspiracy theory without the theory. Uh, in his phrase, a lot of people are saying. Hmm. What people? Oh, a lot of people. What hmm. are they saying? Oh, you can't believe what they're saying. Hmm. That's not even an argument. <laughs> it's like, okay. I mean, at least the flat earthers have arguments. Yeah. They do. They line them up here. You know, if the curvature of the, this is the curvature of the window makes the, whatever. <laughs> you know. hmm. And because part of the Trump has a very specific appeal, as you said, to make arguments that aren't fully formed or anything. Do you think to combat that sort of stuff, you could, people kind of have to play on Trump's level, or do you think we can rise a little bit above it? No, I got to rise above it. I mean, you just can't. I I don't know what to do about that. I mean, the 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 GOP, the Republican Party, is just shattered. Mm. And you know, because it's a two-party system, there's only two teams. Uh, and one of them is going to win uh, pretty much no matter what you think about Trump. If you're on that team, you're going to vote for him. Mm -hmm. uh, almost everybody. Well, not, maybe not everybody because he lost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's possible. Right. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.